Chapter 36. Eritrea, Will exclaimed softly, surprise and weariness in his voice. Disregarding the pain from his injury, he pushed himself up on one elbow for a closer look. What are you doing here? Saving you, it would appear, she laughed, her dark eyes mischievous. Sudden movement caught his eyes and he stared past her into the shadows. Two rover women had busied themselves at a sideboard near the rear of the wagon, rinsing red clothes red with, with his blood in a basin of water. Instinctively, he reached up to his head and found that a bandage had been placed across the wound. He touched it gingerly and winced. I wouldn't do that, Eritrea brushed his hand aside. It is the only part of you that is clean. The mailman glanced about quickly. What have you done with Amberley? Your sister? She mocked. She is safe enough. You will uh, excuse me if I am a bit sceptical about that. He started to rise from his bed. Stay, Hila. She forced him down again. Her voice lowered so that the woman behind her could not hear. Do you fear I might seek revenge because of your ill-conceived decision to leave me behind at the turfing? Do you think so little of me? She laughed and tossed her head. Perhaps now, though, if you were given the chance, you would reconsider that decision. Is that possible? Not in the least. Now what about Amberley? Had I intended to harm you, Willemsford, or to her, I would have left the both of you to the cutthroats who chase you through Grimpen Ward. The oven girl as well. I will have her bought after we have talked. He turned to the woman at the sideboard. Go, leave us. The woman stopped what they were doing and disappeared through a flap at the other end of the wagon. When they had gone, Eritrea turned back to the valman, her head cocked to one side. Well, what shall I do with you now, Will Armsford? He took a deep breath. How did you find me, Eritrea? She grinned easily enough. Word of your great healing power spread the length and breadth of Grimpen Ward. Within ten minutes of the time it took you to cure for that fat woman innkeeper, did you think that such a noisy performance would go unnoticed? How do you think it was that you were found by those cutthroats? You knew of that too? Gila, you are a fool. She said it kindly, her hand reaching up to touch his cheek. Rovers are the first to know anything that happens in the places where they travel. If it were not so, they would not long survive. A lesson you apparently have yet to learn. Once word of your wondrous act of healing, it was obvious to anyone with half a brain that there would be surely a man of well. Greed and drink mix well, Gila. You are lucky to be alive. I suppose so. He and Oiled chagrined. I should have been a bit more careful. A bit, fortunate for you, fortunately for you, I realised who you were and prevailed upon the fellow to let me find you. Once the cry went out up from the inn, otherwise you might be food for the dogs. A pleasant thought, Will grimaced. He glanced at her quickly. The fellow knows that I am here? He knows. She smiled and the mischievous returned into her eyes. Does that frighten you? Let's just say that it concerns me, Will admitted. Why should he do anything for me after what happened back in the turfing? Eritrea leaned close and put her slim, dark arms about his neck because his daughter is persuasive, Gila. Persuasive enough that at times she may influence even so difficult a man as Cephalo. She shrugged. Besides, he has had time to rethink what happened at the turf thing. I have convinced him, I think, that it was none of your doing, that in fact you saved the lives of the family. Will shook his head doubtfully. I don't trust him, nor should you, she agreed. But for tonight at least, he should cause you no concern. He will wait until morning to have you answer to him. By then, at any rate, your pursuers will have worn themselves out chasing shadows and have gone back again to the taverns for fresh ale and more tangible source of gain. 
She rose and slipped away in a flash of blue silk and returned a moment later with a damp cloth and a fresh basin of water, which she placed on the floor next to the bed. We must clean you up, Hila. You reek of sweat and dirt, and your clothes are ruined. She paused. Take them off, and I'll wash you. Will shook his head. I will wash myself. Can you lend me some clothes? She nodded, but no, made no move to go. The veilman flushed. I would like to do this by myself, if you don't mind. The dazzling smile broke across her face. Oh, but I do mind. He shook his head. You really are incorrigible. You are for me, Will answered. I told you that before. The smile faded, replaced by a look so sinuous and compelling, compelling as to cause Will to forget momentarily what it was that he was doing. When she started to lean toward him, he forced himself to sit up quickly on the bed. Dizziness washed over him, but he kept himself upright. Will you bring me the clothes? For an instant, her eyes went dark with anger. Then she rose, crossed to a cupboard, removed some clothing and brought it to him. You may have these, she tossed them in his lap. She started past them, then dipped suddenly and kissed him quickly on the mouth. Wash and dress yourself then, she snipped, slipping away. She opened a door at the end of the wagon and disappeared into the night. Closing the door behind her securely and latching it from without, Will grinned in spite of himself. Whatever her intentions, she was not about to let him run off. Quickly, he stripped away his old clothing, washed and put on the clothes the red tree had supplied. They fit well, though. They were the clothes of a rover, and he felt more than a little strange wearing them. He had just finished dressing when the door opened again, and a red tree appeared with Amberley. The elven girl was dressed in rover pants and tunic with a sash and headband to hold her hair back. Her face was freshly scrubbed and a bit startled. She glanced at Will's head and there were immediate concerns in her green eyes. Are you all right? She asked quickly. I have seen to his needs. The Richard brushed the question aside smoothly. She pointed to the bed opposite Will's. You can sleep there. Be certain that you do not try to leave the wagon tonight. She gave Will a knowing smile, then turned away and moved to the door. She was halfway through when she glanced back suddenly. Good night, Brother Will. Good night, Sister Amberley. Sleep well. With a grin, she slipped through the door, the latch fastened behind her with a click. The veilman and the elven girl slept that night within the rover wagon. It was dawn when they awoke, the new light seeping through cracks in the shuttered windows to light the dusky gloom. We will lay silent for a time gathering his thoughts, waiting for the sleep to clear from his eyes. After a moment, he reached within his tunic for the small leather pouch containing the elfstone, checked to be certain that they were still there, then replaced the pouch. It did not hurt to be careful, he thought. He was halfway out of the bed when Amberley ordered him back in again, scrambling up on the other bed to reach him. Carefully, she examined the injury to his head and readjusted the bandage. When she had finished, Will pushed himself up beside her and surprised her with a quick kiss on one cheek. She flushed slightly and smiled, her child's face beaming. A short time later, the door latch released and Eritrea stepped through, carrying a tray of bread, honey, milk and fruit. Brown limbs slipped from beneath the diaphanous, white, dazzling white smile flashed at the veilman. Well rested, Will answered. She deposited the tray on the lap and winked. The fellow will speak with you now. She left without saying a word to Amberley. Will glanced at the elven girl when, we her, when Eritrea had gone and shrugged helplessly. Amberley's smile was forced. Minutes later, the fellow appeared. He entered without knocking, his tall, lean frame stooping slightly as it passed through the entry, dressed in black and wrapped in the cloak of forest green. He appeared just as he had when they first met on the banks of the Mermaid. The wide brim hat was cocked jauntily on his head and he removed it with a flourish as he entered, a broad grin splitting his swarthy face. Ah, the elflings. The healer and his sister 
we meet again, he bowed, still looking for your horse. Will smiled, not this time. The rover looked down the length of his hooked nose at them. No? Have you lost your way then? Arbalon, as I remember it, lies north. Uh, we have been to Arbalon and left again, the Valman replied, seeing aside the tray. Come to Grimpen Wood? Both of us, it seems. Indeed. The tall man seated himself opposite the two. In my case, business take me many places that I might not otherwise care to go. Well, what of yourself, Hila? What brings you to Grimpen Ward? Surely not the prospect of applying your art to the denizens of so shabby a village as this one? Will hesitated a moment before responding. He was going to have to be very careful with what he told to fellow. He knew the man well enough to now appreciate the fact that if the rover were to discover anything that he might turn into his own advantage, he would be quick to do so. We have business of our own, he replied carelessly. The rover pursed his lips. You do not seem to be doing very well in, in its pursuit, Hila. Your throat would be cut by now if it were not for me. We wanted to laugh aloud. <laughs> the old fox, he was, a, he was not about to admit that Eritrea had anything to do with saving them. We seem to be in your debt once again, he offered. Sir Fellows wrote, I was hasty in my judgment of you at the turfing. I let my concern for my people override my common sense. I blamed you for what happened when I should have thanked you for aiding. That has bothered me. Saving you now eases my sense of guilt. Oh, I am gratified to learn that you feel this way. Will did not believe one word of it. This has been a difficult time for me, my sister and me. Difficult, said fellow's dark face mirrored, sudden concern. Perhaps there is something more that I can do to aid you. Something to be of service? If you tell me what it is exactly that brings you to this most dangerous part of the country, here it comes, Will thought. Out of the corner of his eye, he watched Amberley frown in mourning. I wish that it, it were within your power to help, Will did his best to sound sincere, but I am afraid that it is not. What I need most is the guidance of someone familiar with the history of the valley. It marks in its legends. So fellow clapped his hand lightly. Well then, perhaps I can be of assistance after all. I've travelled the wilderness many times. He lifted a long finger to the side of his head. I know something of its secrets. Perhaps, Will thought. Perhaps not. He wants to know what we are doing here. The Valman shrugged. Oh, I do not feel that we should impose further on your hospitality by involving you in our fears. My sister and I can manage. The revolver of his face was expressionless. Why not tell me what it brings you here? Let me judge if the imposition is so great. <laughs> Amberley's hand closed tightly on Will's arm, but he ignored it. Keeping his eyes locked onto fellows, he knew that he was going to have to tell the rover something. There was a sickness within the house of the Alessa Dogs. All of the elves, he lowered his voice. The king's granddaughter is very ill. The medicine she needs is an exact e extract from a root that can only be found here, within the watering. I alone know that, and my sister, we have come here in search of, the, of that root. For if we can find it and carry it to the oven ruler, that reward will be great. He left Amberley's, he felt Amberley's grip loosen abruptly. He did not dare to look at her face. The fellow was silent for a moment before replying. Do you know where within the water in this route can be found? The Valman nodded. There are books, ancient books of healing from the old world that speak of the route in the name of its location, but it is a name long since forgotten long since erased from the mats that serve the races now. I doubt that the name would mean anything to you. The rover leaned forward. Tell it to me anyway. Safehold, Will declared, watching the other's dark face. The name is Safehold. Sir Thalo 
thought for a moment, then shook his head. You were right. The man, the name means nothing. Still, he paused deliberately, rocking back slightly as if in deep thought. There is one who might know his name this name. Well, I'm familiar with the old names of this valley. I could lead you to him, I suppose. Uh, but Gila, the wilderness in this very dangerous country, you know that yourself, since you most certainly crossed through some small part of its forests to read Grimpen Wood. The rest of my people and myself, if we are to aid you in such a perilous search, would be great. He shrugged apolo- apologetically. Besides, we have other communi- uh, commitments, uh, other places to which we must travel, other business to which we must attend. Time is a precious thing to such as we. Surely you can appreciate that. What is it that you are saying? The Velman demanded quietly. That without me, you will fail in your quest. That you need me. That I in turn wish to offer my help. But such help as you seek cannot be given without um, adequate compensation. Will nodded slowly. What compensation? Sir Fellow, the rover's eyes glittered. The stones you carry, the ones that hold the power. The Valman shook his head. They would be useless to you. Would they? Is their secret so dark? Sir Fellow's eyes narrowed. Do not suppose me a fool. You are no simple healer. That much was obvious, almost from the moment we first met. Still, it matters not to me who you are, only what you have. You have the power of the stones, and I wish it. Their magic is elven, will force himself to remain calm, hoping desperately that he had not lost control of the situation. Only one of elven luck could weld their power. You lie badly, healer. The big man's voice was ugly. He speaks the truth, Emily interjected quickly, her face frightened. If not for the stones, he would not have even attempted this search. You have no right to ask him to give them up to you. I have the right to ask whatever I choose, Sir Fellow snapped, brushing her words aside with a wave of his hand. In any case, I believe neither of you. Believe what you wish, Will's voice was steady. I will not give you the stones. The two men stared wordlessly at each other for a moment. The rover's face hard and threatening, yet there was fear there as well. Fear generated by Sir Fellow's vivid memory of the power lock within the Alpsone, power that Will Onford had mastered. With great effort, he forced himself to smile. Hmm. What will you give me then, Gila? Am I expected to do the service for nothing? Am I expected to risk lives and property without any form of compensation at all? There must be something of value that you can give me. Something that has uh, worth equal to that other stone you so stubbornly refuse to yield? What then? What will you give me? Will tried desperately to come up with something, but there was absolutely nothing else he carried that was worth more than a few pennies. Yet, just when he had decided that the situation was hopeless, Cephala snapped his fingers sharply. I will make a bargain with you, Hilo. You say that the Elven King will reward you if you bring him to, if you bring him the medicine that will cure his granddaughter. Very well. I will do what I can to help you learn something of this place you call Safo. I will take you to the one who might know the name. I will do that and nothing more. In exchange for this, you must give me half of whatever reward you receive from the Elven King. Half. Is that agreed? We'll thought it over a moment. A curious bargain. He decided Robert seldom, if ever, gave anything away without first getting something in return. What was the fellow about? Are you saying that you will help me learn the location of Safehold? If I can. But you will not come with me to find it. The fellow shrugged. I have no risk, wish to risk my life unnecessarily. Finding the medicine and conveying it to the Elven King's granddaughter is your problem. My part of the bargain is to merely help you on your way. He paused. Do not, however, presume that once you are gone, therefore free of me, any attempt to cheat me of what you owe me would end very badly for you. The Valman frowned. How will you know whether or not I am successful if you do not come with me? 
So fellow laughed. Hila, I am a rover. I will know. I will know all that happens to you. Believe me. The smile was so so wolfish that for an instant Will was certain that there was another meaning to his words. Something was wrong. He could sense it. Yet they needed his help from somewhere, from somewhere to finding their way through the wilderness. Help that would permit him to forego, forego any use of the options. If Sathalo were to give them that help, it might mean the difference between success and failure in finding the blood fire before the demons found them. Is it agreed? Sathalo asked again. Will shook his head. We would test the rover. Only half is too much. I will give you a third. A third? The fellow's face darkened momentarily, then relaxed. Very well. I am a reasonable man. A third. That had been entirely too easy, Will thought. He glanced at Amberley, seeing in her eyes the same trust that flickered in his own. But the elven girl said nothing. She was leaving the decision to him. Come, come, Elfling, the fellow pressed. Do not be all day about it. Velma nodded. All right, it is agreed. Good. The rover stood up immediately. We will leave at once, since our business here is ended. But you are to remain within the wagon for a time. It would not do to have you seen again in Grimpen Ward. Once we are into the deep forest, you may come out. He smiled broadly, dipped the wide brim hat in parting and passed back through the entry. The dark door, door clo- the door closed softly behind them and locked. Will and Amberley sat staring at each other. I don't trust him, Amberley whispered. Will nodded, not at all. Moments later, the wagon lurched board and began to roll, and their journey into the wilderness was underway once more.